So, you know, one of the things that we've talked about is, and again, I think many of us have had an understanding of this as we've been more engaged in treating bone health. We've started ADT clinics. We've understood that androgen deprivation therapy does have some deleterious effects on, on bone mineral density. Uh, we were more engaged in calcium, vitamin D, the establishment of bone clinics. Now we also have these, again, getting, getting now into this, this, uh, the, all the newer therapies that are available. We have a uh, alpha emitter radiopharmaceutical, radium-223, that is approved for the, cast for the metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer patient who was, quote, minimally symptomatic or asymptomatic. Uh, we know that it's, a, it's, it's an alpha particle, therefore the, the side effect profile is it looks really good. It's got a survival benefit based upon the Alsimca trial of 3.6 months, fairly easy, fairly easy to administer. Again, interestingly, uh, has a survival benefit even though we're not really touching the androgen receptor, which I think is going to, you know, we're going to need to kind of look at that closely. So, Brian, I know you've got a very active clinic. Tell us how you've incorporated uh, radium-223 uh, in Eugene. Yeah, so the biggest hurdle was first getting our radiopharmaceutical license. Luckily, I have a younger uh, radiation oncologist who had that uh, credential to deal with radiopharmaceuticals coming out of his training, so two hurdles. Um, I think we've treated somewhere in the lower 20s, less than 25 patients with radium-223. We've given over 40 doses. Um, really, the actual process of giving the one-minute IV push of the medication is very straightforward monitor their CBCs, there's criteria that you check before each one. Um, patients have done well. Um, probably as we've gone forward, we've learned that you need to find these patients a little earlier. My radiation oncologist was having trouble giving a patient all six treatments when they were presenting late because they were progressing and really failing as, you know, with their disease. So we've been more aggressive trying to identify them earlier now. Um, and it, it does raise the possibility of overlapping therapies. If a patient's on abiraterone, for example, can I combine that with radium-223 in appropriate patients? Ken, you've got a little different challenge. You're in, you're in metropolitan Detroit. You've got offices scattered all throughout Detroit in the northern tiers. How are you guys looking at radium-223 and how are you going to incorporate that into your, into your business? Model? Yeah, one of the things we did is we went to some of the primary hospitals that we went to initially as, because we don't have a radiation oncologist, we don't do radiation oncology in our group, and went to them and actually helped educate them on this, this radio pharmaceutical and said, look, we have these patients, you need to help us get access, the, our, access for our patients for that. So at, uh, at Beaumont Troy Hospital actually was the first one in the area that we treated at that hospital. So we got them up and running quickly. Royal Oak Beaumont followed behind it. So now they're really a referral source for most of our patients. Since then, you know, more of the other hospitals in the generalized area have, have uh, gotten up and running with radium-223. And again, we've had very similar results that Brian has. We've uh, personally probably treated about 15 patients and very happy with the, uh, with the results. But again, earlier seems to be better again. Can I just add to that? You know, um, in our particular cohort, we do have a radiation oncology sort of on site, so I've, we've treated maybe about 40 patients. And one of the things that I was interested in looking at is that we know that with CIPT that earlier is better. And the question is, is whether or not earlier is better with Sofigo. One would think it's the same thing. And the average PSA in the Alsimpka, or the median PSA for treatment was in the 120 range or so. And I looked at our own numbers, and we're treating patients with their median PSA of 30. So, you know, I, I'm wondering if we were to look at this sort of amongst the entire country as urologists are getting hold of these medicines and pushing the referral, you know, in your uh, microenvironment you have in the hospital, you're doing it in your, you know, is whether or not we're going to find a better benefit than what was seen in Alsimca, similar to the quartile data with, with CIPT. So, so, if I can add, so that's a great point. So, if you looked at the Alsimca data, we actually presented this uh, at AUA last year, and it's in the process of being, you know, uh, submitted for publication now, is, you know, uh, about 55% of the patients were post-chemo and about 45% of the patients were prior to chemo because they were deemed either ineligible, refused, and tolerant. And if you break down the Kaplan-Meier curves for those patients um, before or after chemotherapy, the overall survival of Alsimca was 3.6 months. The patients who received a six uh, cycles, a full course, was 3.1 months post-chemo, 4.6 months 
pre-chemo to answer which speaks to your what you're querying and so that 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 data is out there and uh, even though it wasn't primary specified to look at that's been an a that's been analyzed and it's in in the uh, should get into the uh, peer-reviewed public uh, domain fairly soon yeah I, I mean I think bears Bayer is obviously very interested in this. I think they are starting their, I think it's called the Reassure Registry, where you know, anybody that gets on this, you know, pretty much like what Dendrion did with Proceed. I think there's going to, because what's interesting, I was talking to Oliver Sartor, and you know, you know, a lot of these patients in Alsimca were European. And so they had, I mean, there was no scanning data. I mean, you know, no, you know nobody knows. So you know, it, it's, it's going to be interesting to see. And again, but, but as, as we've all said, it's, it's yes, as, as Neil has always says, it, it's another arrow in the quiver that, that we fortunately have for, for these advanced patients. So the unique mechanism. Yeah, you know, so, all, yeah, all mechanistically different. And again, the big question is, is combination sequencing, but more importantly, as, as we've all talked about in Ganesh, uh, basically you know, made note, this is gonna be how to monitor these patients. What can we do at the biomolecular level? Because right now we're, we're saying, okay, you, you, some of these, some of these um, therapies don't affect PSA, or depending upon progression, either by clinical symptoms or by scans, and at that point, that may be late. So if we can ide identify, hopefully, a blood-based or urine-based marker, as opposed to having to biopsy everybody, so, I mean, that would be ideal. So uh, this has been, a, I mean, it's been a really good discussion. So we've gone over a lot of information on biomarker testing and prostate cancer explored several new agents that are now available. Uh, to close, I'd like to get final thoughts from all of you uh, in terms of where you think we are, what you would like to really stress to our audience. Chris, I'll let you start. Well, I, I think that the reason that this is exciting is because it's intellectually challenging. There's a lot to do. Even preparing for having this discussion, I needed to look at this stuff last night, and this is something that I do every day all the time. So I find that very professionally and personally rewarding, but I think the most important thing is that it's gonna be good for patients. You know, I think long-term with all this stuff that's out there, that it's, it's going to be good for them and we're going to be able to personalize the medicine like Ganesh had said. So for, for that part, I think we're very grateful that we're getting pharma and industry support in this very, you know, exciting field. Yeah, I reiterate that of just, it's a revolutionary time in the treatment of prostate cancer. It is you know, gratifying to be able to tell a man you have metastatic castration resistant disease. For some of these guys, it is going to be their life defining event. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've told a few of them, you chose a good time to have this disease. You have lots of options and things that we can offer you. So, you know, it's, it's a bad diagnosis, but the good news is there's things we can do. Uh, yeah, I mean, an explosion in knowledge and application of diagnostics prognostics and therapeutics to our, for our colleagues I would just suggest think about your current model and how you can improve upon it and don't be afraid to be innovative because that's the only way you'll be able to stay abreast and and try to avoid just you know reflexively sending it somewhere else improve your model because we have all these great opportunities Ganesh? I would agree I think the panelists thus far really summarized it well I'd also just add that particularly those folks in large urology group practices, to really compartmentalize or really funnel patients with very specific disease types to one or two specialists. There's no reason why a large lug puzz uh, can't function like academic departments. In fact, many do already. And really developing areas of specialized expertise with these folks only makes sense. I mean, as Chris mentioned, I, mean, I only do prostate cancer and I'm, it's confusing to all of us. So uh, you can imagine someone who's seeing all kinds of diseases constantly. I can't imagine what that's like. I think the, the, the private practice community should be commended for really reaching out and trying to aggressively learn and do the best thing for their patients. Um, and I think as it gets more exciting for us in the academic world, it gets more confusing for the people who are doing the work. Uh, so I think funneling the patients to, to experts in your group makes a lot of sense and, and staying abreast of the literature. Ken? You know, I think it's an exciting time. You know, it's a revolutionary time. So I always like to talk to patients about hope. And uh, this to me is an incredibly exciting time because they come see you with CRPC. They think they're failing, uh, or they are failing. And now you can tell them, hey, look, you know, it's like, it may be like heart disease, it may be like diabetes. Hopefully you won't die from this. In the short term, we're gonna extend your life. With all these new things out there, it really provides tremendous hope for the patient and us, for us as the clinician as well. So very, very exciting, hopeful times. Well said. So on behalf of our panel, we wanna thank you for joining us and we hope you found this peer exchange discussion to be useful and informative. Thanks so much. <laughs>